We'll begin with uh, Michal Sulawan, a professor of music at the University of Limerick. And before that, of course, uh, a lecturer, senior lecturer in music here at uh, University College Cork, and a very, very influential uh, educator um, at that time here, established, I think, a relationship uh, in the academic context, not just here, but I think then uh, in, in Ireland, and uh, I also internationally, a relationship between uh, traditional Irish music and uh, European uh, art music. That has been, continues to be uh, very influential, and I think actually opened up uh, even greater possibilities uh, for um, uh, a, a kind of global engagement uh, with music, but from an Irish base, and particularly from a Cork base. Michal is the uh, director of the Irish World uh, Academy of Music and Dance at UL, a former student of uh, Alois Fleischmann himself, and as he described earlier, a younger colleague of Fleischmann for some time as well. He is a, a well-known and influential composer, performer, educator and writer, and Michal was the assistant editor of uh, the Sources project. Uh, around which this uh, discussion will gather today. So please welcome Professor Michal Sulawan. This very heavy volume is 50% of what it's all about. I think Mel, you brought this along. Thank you very much. And as Nick just quite dealt with me, it's no harm to bring it along because most people doesn't know it exists. The vast majority of people don't know this book exists. Quite oblivious to the fact that there are 7,000 traditional tunes in it. And given the nature of uh, Irish traditional musicians who are tune hungry, as we know, tune mad and love to have uh, basic notations to take tunes out of. And I question what was the sustainable force that drove Fleischmann? What was the thing that was driving him? That's what fascinates me. Uh, because like so many of us in the room who were touched by him, uh, there was this amazing energy. Somebody, somebody switched him on and he stayed on. <laughs> and in Fleischmann's case, the notion of actually heading into the heartlands of traditional music scholarship itself. Now, Fleischmann, as those of us who knew him, was not a man to be holding up a bar. That was not his thing. He didn't order a pint, sit in the corner and listen to the session. This is not what he did. This was not part of his social milieu. He wasn't somebody who had that kind of indolent, laid back, uh, let's play the few tunes type of thing. So there was a sense where he wasn't fully connected into that world. But he was fully connected into it from the point of view of annotations and notations and manuscripts of the music itself. He was very comfortable here. Uh, and when the notion in the 1960s came uh, of him uh, addressing this work, the sources of Irish traditional music, you know, th there are a lot of people who would, uh, would address that concept differently. Anthropologically, where you would go for the sources of Irish music is you would go to musicians who are currently alive and you'd record them. Uh, historically, to look for the sources of Irish music, you would go back to the earliest possible manuscripts. Uh, Fleischmann was a historian, not an anthropologist, in that sense. For all of the community work, which had an anthropolog anthropological element to it, in the sense it was dealing with living human beings. In the sense of traditional music, it isn't that he wasn't interested in that. He was other and not of that community. But what he was very familiar with was the trace that that community had left over two to three hundred years. And he started into this with the Lute Manuscripts of the 17th century, starting with the first, then moving very rapidly on to the very first collection of Irish music, 1724, Neil Celebrated Irish Tunes, that Nicholas Carlin here produced a wonderful facsimile edition of uh, some years ago. <coughs> and then on through the marvellous 18th century, uh, where music has been picked up, not for antiquarian reasons, but because it was actually permeating the performance life of Anglo-Ireland at the time, not least in Dublin. And then by the time we get to the, 18th, at the end of the 18th century, he starts to pick up bunting. And suddenly it's becoming antiquarian. It's now becoming valuable because it's ancient. To the starting of the Germanic folk consciousness, the consciousness of, the, of, the, of folk culture. And that, that, in a sense, is what I suppose to some degree he comes to Ireland with. A 19th century romanticization of the invention of, to, uh, uh, to the invention of folk and art music. And that's what he picks up. My task, he worked on it for 40 years, consistently. Consistency was this man's middle name. Consistency, perseverance conquers. If you had to write a motto, perseverance conquers, it was perseverance, constant, consistent, continuous, sustainable effort, all the time. 
As we heard this morning, the 16-year-old writing his notebook, as we heard from Johnny Murphy, the very, very early um, report in the, in, the, in the examiner, the Cock Examiner, of his inaugural lecture, in a way, setting up his manifestation, ma manifesto, which he maintains meticulously throughout his life, not because he's against change, but because he was happy that the manifesto that I think he had set out was the one that he would want to bring uh, right into his next life, in a way. My task, I worked with him for the last 20 years of that. I was 24 when I started working in UCC and in 1975. And uh, I walked into, as a young academic, the shoes of two former colleagues of Fleischmann's uh, uh, who had just passed away. One was Pinnable Leira and the other was Sean O'Beal. He asked Pinnable was, how do you identify Irishness, the sources of Irish history music? So there really was no easy answer to that. I mean, after all, you were dealing with the emergence of what we call Irish traditional music now, which wasn't in existence previous to the 18th century in the sense that we call Irish traditional music now. So we were looking at 7,000 snapshots. I would describe these as snapshots, single snapshots, in music notation of a living tradition. A tune would go like, ba da di da di da da di da di dum 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 the three notes at the end. Uh, the triple repeat of the tonic. And initially I was skeptical, but you know, piece by piece it actually did emerge that it wasn't typical of Manx tunes, or wasn't typical of uh, English trad tunes, or wasn't really typical of Welsh tunes. So that repeated motif at the end became very, very strong. There were other things, particularly Irish harp music, certain motifs that began to uh, emerge uh, through a knowledge of the sources. If you look at, say, 600 harp tunes, and you have them in your head, you begin to find a process which isn't any one of those tunes. So, for example, the opening of uh, Neil's celebrated Irish tunes, the very, very first tune, King of the Blind, begins. Da, 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 di, da, dum, di, da, dum, dum, dum. And you see that motif, di, da, dum, 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 as you all know that, is it? Di, da, dum, 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 da, 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 di, di, dum, is in Tour on the Love. So you can begin to find several, number, several hundred motifs. Now, there's no way that you can tick all the boxes and say, Dov Ri Shin, therefore it's an Irish tune. You put in more rather than less. And in a way, by putting in more rather than less, you hoped that the quantity uh, and the weight of the evidence that would begin to point out this, what the sources were, the identified tunes, uh, the emerging reel, the emerging double jig, the emerging slip jig, in the early 19th century, the emerging polkas and slides, the, the single reels, all of these things that were actually coming in from Scotland, from England, uh, that were meeting something that we were unsure of in a 16th and 17th century Ireland, and were producing now in the 18th century what we now call Irish traditional music. A lot of it is captured actually in these, there are two volumes by the way, this is just one. A lot of it is captured in these two volumes. He knew it hadn't been done. He saw it as a really nice map. I don't think he realised how big a project it was, and I certainly don't think he knew it was going to take 40 years. But I didn't stop him. Because he went back several times and started again uh, when he found different ways of actually doing it, methodological ways of actually doing it. There may have been, perhaps, a certain hope that by surrounding himself with the sources of the music on which he wished to build uh, a particular Irish art music, and there's an interesting overlap with O'Reilly, of course, uh, the same aim from the two men, from two very, very different angles. Uh, the creation of an Irish art music uh, that was somehow or other identifiable as such on a certain local level, but with an international recognition of, of that localism. That maybe by surrounding himself with the 7,000 tunes from the 17th century up until Petrie in 1855, whenever it was, which is when he stopped, because he felt the next thing would be a second, second volume or a third volume, that something of that might rub off, that something might come through, that some series of motifs might actually emerge. Hey. Uh, Nicholas Carlin. Um, Nicholas is the co-founder and the director of the Irish Traditional Music Archive. After his death, I was consulted by Michal regarding the continuance of the project, the finalization of the project in uh, regard to general principles and Michal's capacity as assistant editor. I met all kinds of interesting, exciting uh, people. Sean Maria that was here, Brendan Brannock was here, Shosha Bodley, Prunchies of Cali, don't know any members of Prunchies of Cali now. 
and um, there was um, a refugee from the engineering department, then a music student, who used to heckle Sato Voce. <laughs> <laughs> not not Sato Voce. <laughs> Uh, was, finally, he says, before a national collection can be compiled, it is first necessary for a thematic index to be prepared, both to the published and the unpublished collections. So this project has now begun. It's 1972 we are saying this. When completed, it should open up new areas of research in the field of Irish folk song and ensure that the legacy left by the collectors will be put to the fullest use. Now, unfortunately, he died before he wrote the introduction to the, the, the massive collection, but he did fortunately give the, one of the Aretha Memorial Lectures on the subject, and the Aretha Memorial Lecture became then his contribution to the, to the preface. It's, I presume still available and, and, and can be read. But those few insights there, I, I think, were of interest. In 1972, when he had seriously begun the project, even though it had roots in the 50s, he really, I think, seriously began in the, in the 1960s. What did he and his many associates, all listed there in the front, uh, what did they produce over a quarter of a century later? Well, they produced the largest printed collection of Irish traditional music ever made, 6,841 tunes, melodies, including, by the way, duplicates and versions, so as that would you know, be fewer in terms of, of distinct tunes. He produced them in full melodic score, the harmonic dimensions were ignored, melody is primary here. And that, to me, is, is the major volume, the major value of the work. Um, whatever interest people had in this music, they now had a huge body of it in their hands from 1600 to 1855. Clearly, he had first envisaged a national collection, a huge, collected everything, and practicalities had to, uh, made him stop in 1855. Because after that, the, the sources just increased exponentially. So this is material for the scholar, material to the performer, and in such quantities that access to music and information about the Irish tradition music was revolutionized by this publication. Ironically, as the last thing I say at the moment, it is so large and so revolutionary that it is almost invisible. It's so overwhelming, it's almost as if it doesn't exist. We're in the archive, we're at a point of mediation between the users and, and the books, which we, of course, hold. And you kind of see people falling back defeated. There's just so much, so much about it. I found out that the first two aims, I think, are largely um, realised in the publication itself. Um, but I think it's our responsibility now to bring that person in. Already put into position that he's or not. Let me do it up to now. 